Hello, everyone. A few smiles. <laughs> no, it's early. Thanks for warming up for me, Jo. Um, research is everyone's job, I think. But I'm not going to talk about research for a minute. I'm going to talk about Lego. So you all had some Lego when you came in. Have you all got these? OK. Have you opened your Lego yet? If you haven't, could you open it? There's a very important reason. OK. So my children, I've got two little girls, and I've got a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. We really like playing Lego. And my little three-year-old, Nancy, really likes Hot Dog Man. So if anyone has got Hot Dog Man, <laughs> do you want to swap? You'll make her day, or I'll, uh, I'll come and get it from you in the end. <laughs> so that was just, you know, my way of basically getting hot dog man for Nancy. There's no real connection to research at all. <laughs> no, actually, there is. I'm going to craft it into a, you know, segue into research now. Um, so I was recently playing Lego with Alice, who's just turned seven, and we were in, we were in her room, and um, we were delicately rummaging through the box of Lego, trying to find the pieces um, uh, to play with, and I just did this on the floor, I tip the whole box out, and I probably should say that I'm the one that's always telling out, tidy your room, Alice, look at the state, I can't get in, I can't pull the curtains, I can't get to the window. Oops. Um, so she was a bit shocked, but anyway, it was fine. So we played, it was a rainy Saturday afternoon, and we were playing Lego, and um, it's something I haven't actually, it sounds a bit stupid as a mum, but you don't get a lot of time to sit and play with your children for you know, any longer than about 10 minutes, it seems. Um, so I did spend about two hours in Alice's room with her playing Lego one Saturday afternoon. And she was making, she was freestyling, making a charity shop for some reason, and a cafe. Don't know that she's been to a charity shop before. Um, and I was playing by the rules. I was making the pony stables that she, she had for her birthday. And as I was sat there piecing things together, it kind of made me think of research. I think Lego is like research in that it's about piecing together things, insights, data, to form a narrative. So I think Lego is about telling stories. And I think research is about telling stories as well. So you may have noticed children, when they play with Lego, Particularly, they, they tend to just come up with scenarios and invent stories about what they're doing. So my three-year-old that day, she made an amazing settee. She went running downstairs to set and said to Mark, my husband, Daddy, I've made a settee and it's got an ice cream machine and a, and a, and a tree and a, something else. I don't know, it was amazing. But they just can construct things together in quite an amazing way. I think that... That can be like research. I'll tell you later on why I think it can be like research. So as I say, I think it's about piecing together insights um, and coming up with a co coherent narrative. Whether you're playing by the rules like I was or whether you're coming up with completely new things. Um, so I think that research can really help you make better decisions. And um, I think that if you become a better researcher, it'll help you in your job I think it will help you become a desi better designer, better content creator, developer, whatever it is that you do. Um, and if you give me the next half an hour of your time, um, I'll give you some tips um, and ways to, to help you on your path to becoming a better researcher. So this slide, I put this slide in not, not to say, look at all these great companies I've, I've worked with, but just to actually tell you a little bit about a little bit about my experience. Um, I've done research now for about 15 years, a member of the Market Research Society, not that that actually really means much. Um, and my current job is at Monotype, as Gavin said, I'm the research director there. Um, but during the last 15 years, I've worked uh, for a long time at the BBC, so a big in-house company as an in-house researcher, but I've also spent time agency side, working with clients such as CERN, Shelter, and Act uh, Al Jazeera. I've also run a small startup, that, um, Five Simple Steps, that's now run by the lovely Craig and Amy. So I've got quite a varied experience, and I think hopefully some of that will come through in my talk um, 
different ways of involving research, whatever your background, wherever you work. So, uh, three sections to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the people that should do research, a little bit about the environment for research and ways to um, consider that, and also the landscape of research. I'll explain more about that in a minute. So first of all, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about people and who should do research, but also um, before I talk about who should do research, I'm going to actually talk a little bit more about what research is. So I was talking about research telling a story. So I think the aim of research, like I say, is to piece together data or insights and to join the dots and work out what it's telling us. You might get um, different kinds of... Um, res uh, you can uncover different kinds of pieces of the puzzle um, when you're doing research, so either descriptive information or insights. So if you think about the Lego again, the Lego might be something like a building block, the, just the normal one -er or four -er. Um, sorry, I'm, I don't know what's going on with my clicker. Um, and that just kind of adds um, detail or information to the story. It doesn't necessarily um, add anything more. Whereas insights, I think, are those little light bulb moments, those, those sparks that you get. You know sometimes when you get one of those really weird Lego pieces and you're like, what's that? And then you work out what to do with it and you're like, that's what it's for. That's like an insight, I think. It's that spark that you get in your head, the aha moment. So what's the use of flashes of inspiration? Flashes of inspiration and those aha moments if they're not in the head of the person making the decisions. What if I do all the research and all of those flashes of inspiration are in my head? It's not, I don't, I don't think that's much good. So I think in my experience, this is that article that... Um, uh, Gavin was just referencing. So I wrote, I wrote this in that article. In my experience of working at the BBC, research was most effective when we were embedded in the production team um, and insights were part of the process. So research, either as a function or as a job role, needs to be part of that, of that product team or that, that service. So a really good example of this is GDS, um, the Government Digital Service, which you probably have all heard of, Lisa Reichelt, who's awesome, um, heads up research at GDS, um, and they've got tons of stuff on, um, the, on a blog. But they work agile, they've got, they've got cross-functional teams, and they have a researcher in every team. They've got quite strict processes, but that works for them, because I think everyone knows where they're, um, what, what they should be doing and how they should be working. Um, that's GDS. But I'm not sure that it's practical for everyone to have a user researcher in every single team. Um, and generally in the web industry, I think research forms parts of other people's job, like Joe was talking about earlier. Um, it, was, it was a third of his job. So I did a, I have, it's a, it's a research presentation, so I have to put a couple of graphs in, so you'll have to just humor me for a minute. So I did a little survey last year. I was writing a little piece for NetMag. Um, and I did a quick Twitter survey. I got about 220 respondents, so it's a fairly good sample. Um, and I asked, who does user research in your company? So you can see there that it was mostly designers and um, UX people, um, as well as project managers, but that could also have encompassed product managers, I think. So I think it was only around 16% um, of people that said that they had a researcher or a research team doing research. So, and it was slightly higher for those people who said they worked in-house. It was around 19% of people in-house had a research team. So dedicated researchers are pretty rare. Um, and you should definitely be nice to us. <laughs> but um, it's, it's definitely, more seriously, it's definitely the case at Monotype. So I'm one of two dedicated researchers. Most of the research that's done at Monotype into our products and services is done by designers, product managers, um, product owners, and business, the business managers. So my job at, for, at Monotype is to facilitate research best practice, but also to join the dots 
um, into, uh, into the research that's going on in the organization as a whole. <clears throat> so I think that research is everyone's job. Everyone in this room should be doing uh, research. And I think it's about a way of working. I think it's about experimentation and a way to approach design. I'm using design there, but I think in terms of owning a product or designing or developing a product as well. I think equally that approach, just trying things out um, and seeing, seeing what, what works and, and doing research is like a continual process that I think everyone can, can apply. So like I said earlier, the people making the decisions about a product, a website, a service should be the people doing research. And I believe, as I said earlier, research can be used during the whole design process. So not just in a discovery phase, not just at the end of a project to assess if it was successful. I think it can be applied throughout the project. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about how you can do that. Even if you're a freelancer or working in an agency where you're quite removed from a product, I still think that you can apply um, research and insight at every stage of your project. And, um, you can still surround yourself with information about your target audience or target users um, and help to help you get to know them better and, and make better decisions. So the environment for research is about the conditions for doing research. So like I said earlier, I think research is best done by the people making the decisions. But often, it's not just the people, the designer, who's designing the interaction or the page um, who will be making a decision or need buy-in. You'll also need collective agreement, perhaps, or buy-in from stakeholders or colleagues. So let's have a think about that. <clears throat> One of the worst things to happen to me as a researcher was the, the awful thing where you write an amazing report, you present it to your client or your internal clients, and then they say, that was really interesting. I knew that already. That's also the worst thing to hear. Um, and then they put that report literally on a shelf and leave it. I don't know why it keeps saying that. I'm sorry. Um, and then they li literally leave it on a shelf and it gathers dust and nothing ever happens as a result of it and nothing is actioned. That is soul-destroying after doing all that work. So I've lost count of times that this happens, and it still keeps happening to me now. And it's just about the way you approach research and how you, how you um, get people to buy into it. So I think there's a danger of having a big reveal. Like in design, if you've gone along on a path and you've made decisions, um, and then you present, ta-da, this is this thing that I've done, isn't it fantastic? It's the same thing for research. You go along a path, you learn things, you piece it together, and if you then present it as this fait accompli, people aren't with you, they haven't been on the journey with you. So it's really important that you, you either involve people in the research or you have conversations about the research. The PowerPoint document isn't the research, the research conversations and doing the research is the research. So instead of me telling you all of this. I, sorry, that's really not a very flattering way to, poor Nathan, <laughs> to start a video. What I did was spoke to a couple of the people I work with really quickly. Um, so excuse the gorilla style. It was over Skype the other day and it was two of my colleagues. So this is Nathan Ford. Um, he used to work in Cardiff with us, um, but he's just moved back to Texas. This is actually a real challenge um, because it does help when you can sit in the same room and dig through the data. I find that a much more appealing way to analyze the research. But we have made it work um, by using video chat. Uh, again, you know, being able to see each other's faces helps a lot, uh, hear each other's tone of voice. And, um, and then we, we actually use shared documents like on Google. I guess I'm getting into tools a little bit here. Um, so we, I'll stop there. But being able to, uh, yeah, video chat becomes very important uh, when you're distributed. So what Nathan was talking about there was the fact that he's in a distributed team. So he w he's just moved back to Texas, like I said. He was in Cardiff. 
um, and he works primarily with Nick, who will come on in a sec, um, who's a designer, and he's based out of Manchester. So most of the working day they spend over Skype or um, email, base camp, whatever it is they're using to communicate. So I was talking to them about what the challenges are for doing research. Um, so that's the main point there. Go is. back. A quite an informal chat about it as well. That, so we have a loose structure of how we run through each user test analysis-wise, um, but we we kind of we make it more of a an off-the-cuff chat around that structure. Um, it's making sure that we stick to the process. So I think that's one thing I try to be very um, I don't know mindful of or, or keep the team mindful of is. You know, we have this thing that works, we know it works, and we try to stick to that as much as possible. Not rigid in how we actually talk through the uh, research, but being pretty rigid about making sure that we do circle back on the research for analysis, that we spend the time talking through it, that we block out you know, an hour or sometimes two to make sure that we have enough time to talk through it in depth. You know, the process is really helpful. Okay, so hopefully you could understand uh, understand them there. Um, so they work on a, a number of products for Monotype, by the way. So they're designing things like Typecast, Gridset, Skyfonts, some of those some of those products. So yeah, um, I think it. I think remote research and particularly analysis is, is quite a real challenge. I think you might have heard Nathan say there that there's no substitute for getting in a room with people and just talking face to face about about things, but actually video chat and Skype and those kinds of tools can be really helpful. Um, so that was just a really quick thing about involving people in the research. So neither Nathan nor Nick are researchers. I've worked with them on certain projects. We've, we've kind of collaborated on research where we've all done a bit each and we've got together in a room. But generally, they just get on with it themselves because there's just me. Well, there's two of us now, but there's just me in the whole of Monotype and there's quite a lot of work to do. Um, I can't get involved in every single piece of user research. And Nathan and Nick are more than capable of doing the research themselves. And I think that if that's something that I'll say to you today, if you're thinking about doing research yourself, is just to get on and do it. I think really 18 months, two years ago, because we were working on a lot of client work, um, Nick, as, a, as an example, wasn't necessarily doing any research. but just working alongside me and some of the other team, he's, he's absolutely fantastic now at doing user research. And just, he just got stuck in there and just got on with it. And I'd say, say to all of you just to give it a try um, and you'll learn, you'll learn as you go. So this is a quote from Lou Rosenfeld, who you may all know runs Rosenfeld Media, a, a publisher, and they publish some really fantastic books. There's quite a lot of uh, really good research and UX books um, that he's got. Um, so he wrote this article for a list apart, I think it was 2013, um, and there's a lot covered in it, but I really like this quote, so I've pulled it out. For be forget big data. Right now, our biggest problem is fragmented data that comes from siloed user research teams. So he's absolutely right, and that's what I just mentioned um, earlier as being my job at Monotype, is to join the dots between the teams and the different research going on through the organization. And this is something that you might find if you work at an agency or freelance that you'll, if you start to do, say, say you do some stakeholder interviews and you talk to one stakeholder in this part of the business and then you talk to another stakeholder in this part of the business, they might be saying the same thing, but they're not necessarily saying it to, to, the, to each other. And this can often be a problem in large organizations. And I've come across it in the companies that we've done uh, client work for, but also it, somewhere like the BBC where I worked for a long time. So it's not really enough for the team to be vested in the research. You might be in this room, you've had an amazing session, you've had this great workshop, everyone's fired up, you've come out, you've gone, this is what we're going to do, yeah, and then someone's got to sell it in to management, and it doesn't always work. Joe was talking a little bit about that earlier. It, it can fall on its ass, and that is a horrible moment. So you have to consider, like Joe was just saying, the needs of the organization, the organizational hierarchies um, when you're thinking about research. So I did, in this survey, I asked people about research. 
don't know what's going on. Every time I like move, it changes slides. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a research learning shared across the organisation. So I think half, half there said, uh, well, sorry, 40% said yes sometimes. There was still nearly a third saying that research learnings weren't shared across an organisation. Now, this is the, these are the numbers for the people that work in-house. So that is kind of scary, that research learnings aren't shared across an organisation um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that as, as someone working in another team, you might be, you might be, you know, the, the, sorry, the impact of the decisions made in this side of the organisation might impact on you over here. So you need to understand the research. You need to understand why the decision was made. So that's quite a sad, made, made me feel sad when I read that. Um, so again, understanding the business landscape and the context that you're working in is really key. So one of the things you should do when you start a research project or, or even just start a, a project altogether is, is research, the, uh, look into the organisation, look into the structure and understand the context that you, you need to work in. Because impactful research is the best kind of research. If you're not making an impact, there's not really any point doing research, I would, I would argue. So... An example of this um, is CERN. So I was lucky enough to work, work with CERN when, when, we worked at Mar when we were running Marble and Design a few years ago. So they were a big client of ours, um, fantastic client. So one of the things that we did um, when we worked with CERN, we had um, they've incredibly um, opinionated workforce at CERN, really fantastic clever people working there, but yeah, they have opinions about the way things get done. So that can obviously be quite a blocker if you're trying to move a change through an organisation. And the, changing the website doesn't sound like a very big change, but it was a really big change for CERN, particularly because the focus, I don't know if you've seen any of the work that we did, but the focus is more on the general public now, and it's about creating wonder. So there's a lot of blog posts and talks online that you can go and find um, if you're interested in that. Um, but to sell this change, um, we used a blog. So we had uh, the change blog, which was set up by Dan, who's our client at CERN. Um, so it's just this sort of encapsulates CERN. CERN is a really great place to debate things, to explore, to discuss, to probe. It has a unique stimulating culture where you can put up an idea and have it torn to shreds or have it made better or have it generate a thousand other ideas. It is a healthy, I can't even pronounce that word, <laughs> congeliate culture that is good for the research that takes place here. But sometimes it can be a really challenging place to take simple decisions. So that was where he was introducing the blog, the change blog, in, in one of the first blog posts that he wrote. Um, and that was, that was really the reason why it was, it was designing in the open. It was asking for constant feedback um, and that was one of the, the particular ways that we, we chose to do it. We, at every stage, asked for people's involvement and tried to get them to buy into it. It was, it was often really painful. Some of the feedback we'd get would be excruciating. We'd sit there and go through it and be like, oh, they just don't get it. What are they? What? That's just stupid. Why are they saying that? But it was obviously part of a bigger purpose, and that, that was to make sure that the people that work at CERN were behind what we were trying to do. And one of, the, one of the other things that we did with our clients at CERN was actually to get them to do their own research, which is something that I've done um, quite a lot, lot of times at the BBC. Um, it, it's quite, it can be quite uncomfortable for, for people, particularly senior managers, if you send them out to talk to real people. Um, it, can, it can be quite uncomfortable for them, but it's, it's always a really good way of getting people to be involved in research and to um, understand understand the mindsets of the people that they're commissioning programs for, making business decisions about. Um, so at CERN, we were designing a peop, uh, the CERN People app, which was an app for people that work at CERN to use to help in their daily work. And the, the three people on the client team, we, we all did um, internal interviews with people, and then we came back and workshopped the results. They were a bit skeptical, I think, to begin with, but they were, I think... The reason we did that was because um, 
as, as people work in it soon, they had assumptions. They were coming in with their pre, preconceived ideas about what the app should be. So it was a way of pushing out of that and understanding what the real needs were. So landscape. This is the, the third section. I've talked a little bit about the people who should do research, but I've also talked about the environment for, for doing research. Um, and now this is around the tools and the processes of research. So maybe, you know, what are the instructions? Thinking of our Lego analogy again. Um, often, research is, is the kind of thing that's nice to have or, or it's cut from the scope when doing um, your budget dance, um, if you work in an, in an agency. Um, but it also forms, like I was saying earlier, a discovery phase um, of a project or just becomes like a tick box exercise, which is, again, totally pointless. But I think it can work throughout um, a design process. So I don't know how you, how you work. These are sort of some average workflow diagrams. You've got waterfall there on the left with where you kind of work through um, your cycles of work and you get to the end. Then you've got the kind of agile process, which maybe I feel like people are m working more towards now. I think that's more of the norm nowadays than, than waterfall. Or you've got the everything all the time, which is kind of how we used to work at Mark Bottle Design. It's just blah, whatever. Yep, research, okay, then we'll do this. And there's a bit more on the fly. Um, so I would argue that research can happen at any stage in the process, but it obviously depends on your organization and your, your structure. Um, and like at GDS, they work agile, so it's, you know, it works very well. Everyone knows where they are, and it's a large organization, so I can imagine that that would be a much better setup than this kind of slightly crazy, everything all the time approach on the right-hand side, which worked when you're seven people. So I asked again about when research happened. So this was the, this was everyone. This was the everyone sample. Um, 44% during a discovery phase, 42% during throughout a project. It gets more interesting when you look. These are the people that work in agencies. So you can see that agencies are doing more research during, uh, sorry, my slides are going crazy. But agency people are doing research more in the discovery phase. Um, rather than, but, but still a third throughout the project. Um, and then in-house, generally much more research throughout uh, a project. So I've, we've got this funnel that we've uh, come up with at Monotype, which I've blogged about on my blog. Um, it's kind of been iterated upon since, since the first outing on my blog. But we divide research into four areas, um, and it helps you to think about where research is on your funnel, I think. So basically at the top there, you've got quite exploratory research where you're much further away from the problem. And then you work through the funnel down to the operational stage where you're closest to the problem. I like to think of it as problem solving um, and, and kind of think of it like that. If you don't know what the problems are you, you're, and, and what you're researching, you're likely to be right at the top of the funnel. If you've got a load of data and analytics presented to you by a client, you're likely to be right down at the operational end of the funnel um, where you've got stuff um, and you need to kind of piece it together into a, into a story. Um, and I think if you think about this a little bit further, you can think about research. It doesn't just happen in this kind of sequential stage, you know, exploratory to strategic to tactical to operational. Really, research can, can, it can be like a, a cyclical thing, and insights that you find at an operational level can really go back up the funnel, inform strategy, um, and maybe come up, you know, you can think of new product ideas, um, et cetera. So it's really, like I say, quite a, a cyclical, um, cyclical thing. So let's just talk a little bit about exploratory research. So, I think exploratory research reminds me of my daughter Nancy's t Lego building technique, where she's kind of just randomly finding things and putting them together and trying to find her way through, through, the, through the Lego, if you like. Think of it, thinking of it another way, if you imagine that you're blindfolded in a room without any light um, and you're told if something, there's something in the room, um, 
and you have to find it. So you kind of feel your way around and you shuffle slowly around the room, exploring with your hands until you find something. I think that describes exploratory research really well. Um, so it's research, as I say here on the slide, conducted for a problem that has not clearly been defined yet. A good example of this is um, innocent drinks. So if you all had these really yummy new smoothies. So um, a company that I know that have worked with innocent drinks, they're a market research company in London, they, about two years ago, were asked to do some insight work where they basically were asked to, I think the brief was to um, uncover the uh, risk-adverse behavior of, or some kind of very, of people and their attitudes to vegetables in drinks. So it's some kind of very <laughs> complicated sounding brief. But basically what they did was to go and hang out with people in their kitchens and watch them cook. So they spent a lot of time watching people cook bolognese and hiding vegetables like broccoli and carrots in bolognese um, and talk to them. Um, so they watched them and then they talked to them about what they were doing and they kind of tried to understand their um, attitudes to vegetables and um, whether they would eat them or drink them in situations that they weren't as familiar with. So for example, I think kale in a smoothie, you know, would you instantly think that that would be a nice thing to drink? So that, that was about two years ago. And then, it, so that was very exploratory research and it was around gathering insights and they took all of that back to the client. Um, and since then, lots more work has been done and they kind of gradually, I think, went down that funnel um, and they did lots of campaign testing, lots of product um, and packaging testing. So they moved themselves right down that funnel that I showed you earlier um, until they got the product um, and they launched it. But really the first phase of that, as I said, was this really insight driven um, work where they did observation, particularly as a really good technique for using an exploratory work and ethnography. Although ethnography a, I could go on a mini rant, but I don't think I've got time about ethnography and how it isn't really ethnography unless you're an academic. Um, that was the short rant. <clears throat> okay, so strategic research. This is a lovely picture of Mark's face there um, on, a, on, a, on an iPad. Um, <laughs> we, we, went and we had a little away day about two years ago and... Um, is some like Lego building, or, you know, because we're a web team and you have to do like stuff like that, don't you, to, you know, to fit the stereotype of being a geek. Um, but what, what, the, what we did was to hack um, some of the Technic Lego um, and we, we built this like Lego robot, Skype robot, where you could get Skype on an iPad and then you could drive the robot around the studio so that all the freelancers that we work with could like come and interact with us in the studio, but it was it it worked, it was cool. But um, anyway, so um, do you remember that room that we were just in, in the dark? So strategic research is the act of exploring the thing that you found and creating a fuller picture of it. So you found it, but you're not quite sure what the edges are, what it looks like, and that's what I think um, strategic research is conducted for a problem that's known, where you want to really define your strategy. So an example of that is the responsive report. Have, has everyone seen this? And if you haven't, you should go and read it, because it's really cool. Um, so grid set. Um, originally, actually, it was quite an exploratory piece of research that Mark did. Um, so Mark, my husband, who does a lot of speaking at conferences, was going to talk about responsive design. And he didn't really know what what well, he had some assumptions and some hunches, but he wanted to test them out. So he did a bit of a, an awful survey, to be honest with you. It was awful, and I told him off. I, he really should have spoken to me before he did it on Twitter, but he, he does that quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we refined this survey after he'd done it twice, and we've now done it twice um, under the grid set umbrella, um, and we've got our report. So what we've got here is we've got a really broad-based market survey because it's a survey of the whole web design community. I think we've got around a thousand responses for the last couple of times. So it is quite a broad survey, good sample, considering the amount of people that work in the web community. So that is an, a good example of a strategic report. We, we've used it to inform what we do on Gridset and 
what people are interested in. Um, and that's something that, that you can obviously do as well, is to do a large survey. You don't have to do it yourself. You can commission a market research company to do it. I probably would do that if I was going to do a survey into a whole market. Um, you can partner with people. You, can't, you don't just have to do research yourself. Um, so tactical research. I think this is where a lot of the research that's done in the web industry falls into, so I'm going to spend a little bit longer talking about this. So this is where you're supporting the implementation and direction, worked out during the strategic phase, which is what I've got on the slide there. But what I think this means in plain English is where you're making incremental improvements to a product or you're designing new features for a website. It's really the small details, the tactical aspects. You've already got the approach, the strategy, you know the goals, you know how you're going to get there, and you're just really working towards that goal, and tactical research can really help you to refine and improve something. Whether it be a new website that you're designing as an agency for a client, um, once you've worked out the strategy, you've set that down, you've got that agreed with the client, refining those fine details, or as a product owner, um, you, you know, you're adding new features um, and you're finding out whether they're, they're working for you or not. So the, the method that everyone talks about, it's like the focus groups of the web industry, the semi-structured interview. Honestly, sometimes it really winds me up. But if there is one method that you really should try, if you're, if you're completely new to user research, you really should try the user, uh, the user interview semi-structured interviews, and um, like I said earlier, some of the people I've worked with have recently got into research, and it, it really is a, an easy method to, to start off with, and it should definitely be in your toolkit. There are some considerations. I won't go into it in too much detail, because there's some really good books on interviewing, and these are two of them. One's published by Five Simple Steps, and I think, I don't know where, where um, collection one, but is that one in your collection, Joe? Can you remember? Collection two, see, I don't even remember. So there might be, yeah. Coming up later, you might, might have a chance to win that one. And then <laughs> also Steve Portugal's um, book. He also does an awesome podcast, by the way, Steve, um, if, you, if you're interested in hearing more about research. Some of the considerations, recruitment, you really need to think about recruitment. Um, you can try using a screener for quality. Um, you should always incentivize people. You should always thank them for their time, whether it be... Uh, we use Amazon vouchers quite a lot, but you can... You know, merchandise is always a good thing if you're working at a brand. Um, and I would always try and do more than two user interviews. I would always... Because I hear, hear people saying, just do one, just do two. I don't really subscribe to that. I think you should do at least four or five in one go, whether it be over a week or two week period, because you only really start to see patterns emerge after three or four interviews. And um, I think you can get outliers or quite different use cases that will pop up in a user interview that you're not expecting, and they can really throw you and kind of guide you. So you really need to look for, it, for doing, say, say, five or six at, at the least in one go. Rig is also an important thing to think about. So, say you're a designer doing research. Um, I'm kind of thinking to myself that a lot of designers that are into solving problems and they'll like to jump to a solution. So they might be in an interview hearing things and kind of instantly start to jump into problem solving mode. That's great, but what you really need to consider is that you're there to listen, first of all. So, what I always do, because I'm a bit of a problem solver as well, I'll always start getting a little, ooh, we could do that, or we could do this when I'm in a, an interview. What I'll always try to make myself do is to write notes, to make myself listen. Listen to what you're hearing because of the other thing that I was talking about earlier. You need to piece together what that person A is telling you with what person B is telling you, and make sure if this is a theme, if this is a coherent narratives that you're hearing from lots of people. So you have to kind of rein yourself in. The posh way of talking about that is cognitive bias. So I feel like I'm kind of jumping into Joe's territory a bit there. Um, I always uh, use discussion guides as well for interviews. 
And I don't call it a script because it shouldn't be a script. I think it should be a bit more of an intuitive process that you go through where you're guiding someone through a range of things that you want to find out. Um, and the other reason for that is something else, priming, which is another psychology thing, where sometimes, particularly in a task-based uh, task scenario where you're asking lots of different tasks one after the other, you can find that you, you might be priming a respondent with their response to question two um, by doing question one first. So sometimes you need to think about things like priming and cognitive bias. But again, I'm not going to talk too much about that now. There's lots of stuff, probably on Joe's blog, about things like, no, OK, shaking his head. Um, the other thing is collaboration. And I think it works really well to collaborate with people on research. So my preferred method is to pair with someone when I'm interviewing. Um, I like to either take notes for someone else or I like to concentrate on asking questions. Um, I find it really hard to do the two things at once. Um, and I think as well, you've got, you've got different viewpoints. You might hear something differently to your colleagues. So it's really helpful and a good way of um, carving up the workload to, to work with someone else and to maybe take it in turns to be the interviewer and the note taker. So I've got, here's Nick again. Sorry, it's really hard to... Process-wise, we try and treat it as much as we can as if you are in the same room and you are using post-it notes. So um, what we do, we go... Wh whoever did the interview, say it was me, I would talk through the answers, so uh, the feedback I got from the user. And at any point in time, anybody can jump in and um, say, hang on, let's start, let's talk about it. And then if it's... A kind of bigger point that we want to try and remember or capture, we will just highlight it in yellow. So the highlighting um, becomes a post-it that we can circle back on uh, later on. So it actually, from, from the beginning to the end of the research process, uh, we do actually use a lot of tools. So first of all, we typically keep uh, feature cards in Trello, and we make sure that we have a, a column in Trello that's specifically for testing so that we know um, that that's part of this process. Everything needs to be tested, everything needs to be validated with users um, and strengthened with users. So then from there, uh, we have, we usually use email uh, to contact people. We, we actually, oh, I'm sorry, backing way up, we have, uh, we usually have run surveys at some point in time uh, with opt-ins from uh, users, so that helps us build a pool of users to uh, talk to. And then we send emails out to some of those users. We kind of try to narrow it down to what we're thinking will be best for this particular round of testing. Uh, we try to get back, usually in an interview round, we try to get about 10 uh, users to talk to. Uh, so we schedule them in. We use a, a tool called Schedule Once, scheduleonce.com, to schedule people in. They can basically, we just open up a bunch of slots and they can jump on. Uh, the user can jump on, that is, and uh, select what time works best for them. And then from there, we run the, uh, the interviews via Skype, usually, uh, with screen sharing um, and or video chat. And let's see. So then from there, we get to the analysis point. So while, while we're talking to the user, we're usually just writing notes. Um, you know, we do it really guerrilla style, so we don't have usually two people available to run the interview. So it becomes uh, just us having to kind of pause here and there and, and take notes. Uh, and then we, we distill those into Google Docs. And then as Nick described, uh, we go through that process. We get everybody that was involved, everybody that needs to be involved, every stakeholder on a call on Skype. And, uh, and we pull up uh, the Google Docs and work through them live on the Docs there. And uh, we highlight the things that are interesting. And whoever did run the interview, we make sure is the one that runs through the, uh, the notes because they can then add details about what the user was feeling, uh, what, what they did, like what the actual behavior was because a lot of that's hard to capture in words. And then at the end of that, we usually do a roundup email to everybody that was involved in the, uh, in the analysis, just saying this is the next steps that we're going to do. We distill those back into the Trello card and we get to work. And um, so, again, 
Nathan and Nick are working remotely, so Nick was describing how they do remote analysis because our preferred method is to just get in a room with a bunch of post-it notes and theme them. That's the quickest and easiest way to, we found to, and I think that's the way that, G, well, I know that's the way that GDS work as well because Lisa's done a brilliant blog on their process. Um, but if you're not in a room with someone, that was the process that they described and they work with people. So there's teams in Belfast, there's teams in the States and there's um, developers in India. So really that's the way that they've worked out to be, to be the best way. But obviously there's no right way. And I think what you need to do is work out what works for you and try different things with research. Just don't be scared of it. Just get in and, and do it. So the last type of research is operational research. So this is, this is where the analytics and the metrics come in and all of that data and stuff that you've got probably on an ongoing basis if you run a product sort of, kind of coming at you, you know, sales revenue and page impressions and all this, quite a lot of the time, meaningless stuff. What does it actually mean? And I think the job of a researcher, um, and, and if you haven't got a researcher, the job of a, perhaps a designer or a product manager or a project manager is to, to work out what this is telling us. Um, because analytics need tracking and charting and interpreting to be useful. So that really is, is what a good researcher will bring, is in interpretation and analysis. Um, you need to think about how you join the dots. So one quick, it's just a really quick video of Nathan, because he's a product manager. So he's moved from design, um, he was a creative director, and now he's moved into being a product manager role. But that's awesome. I think designers should be product managers. So he's just going to talk about what he does with metrics, which he's calling as quant. As quant, what I do is I try to pick out trends uh, to start hypotheses from. Uh, and then we can use these uh, to dig into. So quant is kind of like your base level as you go um, trying to understand what's happening with your app or your or whatever you're trying to do and then uh, you can dig in with interviews and that's at least how we use it. And then after the interviews it helps us you know create and kind of uh, refine any ideas that we have into you know good features that make sense for users and then we implement those and then we, we usually put some tests into each feature so that we can say, is this actually working like we expected when it goes out into the wild? And from there we then do a further analysis to make sure that what we're doing is continually improving the product rather than just you know, throwing features out there and seeing what sticks. Cool, so this is uh, Aaron Walter who works at MailChimp, the head of UX there. He talked um, about insights on a list apart, um, the same time that Lou did that fantastic piece um, on a list apart. So I think, it, like I say, it was 2013. The link's at the bottom. Um, what I'll do afterwards is I've got a collection of links, resources, books, that kind of thing. I'll put that on my blog, and I'll put my link to the blog at the end. Um, and Aaron's, Aaron's and some of the other links will be on there. Um, what Aaron has, and he's also done some talks about this, is how they, how they piece together insights at MailChimp. So they're doing lots of different kinds of research at MailChimp. He's grown the team from a team of one to a team of, I think, 11, he said at the time that he wrote the piece. Um, and one of the problems was there was fantastic insights stuck in either people's heads over in this part of the organization or in this part of the organization. And there were, there were things that might really help other teams. So we have the same problem at Monotype. A lot of our products are around fonts or selling fonts or designing with fonts. And whilst they're not directly about a product or a service, it's about a designer and how they use fonts and how they work with fonts in their workflow. And some of the things that the My Fonts team might find out about would be really interesting for the guys over at Typecast. But they're physically located in different parts of the world and they're working in very different team structures. So one of the challenges for working in a big company is to work out how you get those little light bulbs, those little pieces of insight to, to be joined up. So MailChimp have got this fantastic way of doing it. They use Evernote for that. So there's a, um, Aaron's written an article about that. Um, he says it's about creating connections in, in data um, and, and they use it as a, as a database. So that was, that's, that's my material I've got to talk to you about today. Um, and just to run through quickly what I said, um, I think 
really the people making the decisions should do the should do research. So that's everyone in this room. If you're if you're designing products, if you're creating content, if you're managing products or services or websites or client work, you should get involved in research. So if there is another industry comp <laughs> and Gavin stands up, it would be great to hear that more of you have tried research and, and got it into your process. And you need to stop working in silos as well. You need to stop seeing something as someone else's job. We need to be talking more, having conversations um, about our work, and be transparent with our stakeholders and our colleagues and our clients. Um, and like I said earlier, research can happen throughout a project. It shouldn't just be in a, a particular phase on a process diagram that you sell to the client. Even if the client won't pay for the research, you know, kind of like the 15,000 pounds worth of research, like Joe was saying, there's, you can just get out and talk to people. Just um, find your users, find ways to involve it. Just think, think differently. There are some great books um, to help you with some ideas. One of the ones that comes to mind now is um, James uh, Box and Kenneth's book. It's, I think it's four years old, old now, but it's still got some really good stuff in um, about guerrilla research techniques. So I'd recommend going away and having a read of, of some of the books that I'll put on my blog later, because I think research is everyone's job. What are you waiting for? And I'm going to get that from you. <laughs> And there's, there's me on Twitter, and um, I'm quite often just talking really boring stuff about my kids. Um, but sometimes I talk about research as well. <laughs>